Alright, here's another video from WeldingTipsAndTricks.com. I hope you packed a lunch. This is going to be a really long one, but I've got a lot to say, and I wasn't smart enough to break it into several shorter videos, so here we go. On to stainless steels now, and let's talk about some of the properties of stainless steels. Got some piece of, uh, I got a piece of 304 stainless steel that's been rolled here non-magnetic. Now, if I'm really careful, I've got a pretty strong magnet here, I can feel a slight, very slight pull. Will not even hold the weight of the stainless up, but it's basically non-magnetic. It can be magnetic if it's cold worked enough. In other words, you take a piece of stainless steel and you roll it through some rollers or you beat the crap out of it with, some, with a hammer, mash it, mash it, mash it with a hammer, it's, it can become pretty distinctly magnetic. Cold worked stainless steel is often magnetic, especially certain grades of stainless steel. Most 300 series stainless steels, non-magnetic. However, 301 stainless is a, is a work hardenable stainless steel. They're all work hardenable, but it is especially work hardenable. And it's fairly strongly magnetic. See what I'm talking about? It'll hold, that, hold its weight up there. 301 stainless steel, almost the same composition as 304. Very similar, except it's got, uh, got more manganese in it that provides for work hardening. And uh, it comes in quarter hard, half hard, etc., etc., full hard type conditions, which means a degree of cold working. Now, welding actually will soften it in the weld heated area, in the heat affected zone. So you strengthen it, you got it all strengthened by cold working, but then when you get it on up to melting temperature and in the, in the, in the zone next to the weld where it, was, where it reached a, a recrystallization temperature, it kind of you take the cold work out of it. Those grains that are elongated now uh, kind of relax, and the stress isn't locked into it anymore. That's what makes uh, cold worked metal stronger and harder is because there's stress that's locked into it. And it's fighting one, fighting each other, and, and it makes it stiffer and stronger. All right, so we got 304 stainless and 301 stainless. The difference, magnetic, not magnetic, magnetic. Now. 300 series stainless steels are largely what people talk about when they think of stainless steel. And the most common is 304. It's uh, pretty good on corrosion resistance. It's pretty good on weldability. It's pretty good on everything. And it's, it's the most common. It's what you see when you go into McDonald's uh, behind the counter. It's what you see when you eat supper with your stainless steel fork and, and, uh, and spoon. It's, it's uh, used for beverage containers, beer kegs. Uh, whether you're using a you know a pan for maple syrup or a dairy farm piping and tanks and containers, all is going to be made out of uh, either 304 or 316 stainless steel for the most part. There's always exceptions, but those two are the main uh, food grade type stainless steels and also marine grade. Uh, a lot of discussion on which is best. Uh, a lot of people think 316 is way better for marine grade. A lot of it depends on how bad it's cold worked. It depends on the thermal history, the processing, all that kind of stuff. Uh, 316 is more corrosion resistant than when you when you talk about stainless steels. You can break them down all kinds of different ways. Uh, the books normally talk about austenitic, martensitic, ferritic, duplex, and precipitation hardenable. That's a mouthful, right? You will hardly ever see, unless you're an aerospace welder or uh, doing something kind of niche, you will hardly ever see precipitation hardenable stainless steels. Very common in aerospace and, and aircraft though. Uh, duplex, unless you're a pipe welder, you've probably never seen any duplex stainless steels. It's largely used for piping. So the ones that, that, uh, that most people will see are austenitic, which is the 300 series stainless steel, and, um, and some people that work on uh, automotive stuff, exhaust systems, are going to see 409 and uh, some other 400 series stainless steels and also 400 series are widely used in gas turbine engines land both land based as well as uh, as aircraft engines alright so um, there are some welding techniques though that go into basically you can almost almost extrapolate them across the board okay and, and those are this Thir uh, stainless steels basically are not very thermally conductive which means heat builds up that's why it's a little harder to weld because if you don't get in and get out, if you don't get in and get moving, things start to heat up, they start to expand and distort, they start to oxidize, they start to look like ass. It's, things go south on you quick with stainless steel. So there are some things that you almost need could say that you need to do with all stainless steels. And let's talk about those because we, we can't make a 40-minute video here talking about every single technique for every single stainless steel. All right? 
So, what are they? Let's, a couple of myths first, all right? One myth we already talked about is uh, stainless steels are non-magnetic. Well, we know already that some are, okay? Some are. That's 301. That's pretty freaking magnetic right there. It'll hold, hold a, almost hold its own weight up there. Not as magnetic, like I said, as carbon steel, but magnetic. 304, pretty much not magnetic. Slightest, slightest, slightest pull. All right, but there are some that are 400 series are, are almost as magnetic as carbon steel. Okay, so another another myth is stainless steels don't rust. Anybody that's uh, into marine hardware knows differently. And also, uh, it largely depends on how it's treated when it's welded. If you get it too hot, if you use a carbon steel uh, wire brush, if you use a stainless steel wire brush that's been previously used on carbon steel, you can you can introduce some free iron particles and some carbon and cause rusting, especially when you're wire brushing a, a hot area. You leave little particles there, a little moisture, you're going to have rust. All right, so what are some things we can do on stainless steels? Number one, we need to purge it. We need to purge the back side if we're going to penetrate through. Sugaring, no good. In order to purge the back side, you're going to need an extra flow meter for an extra argon line. And you can fabricate your own backup boxes out of uh, perforated copper or copper tubing with holes drilled in it. Whatever. Anything is better than nothing. But you've got to purge that back side if you want to maintain the corrosion resistance of that stainless steel. Anything to avoid this mess here. This is going to cause problems. It's going to corrode. It's going to trap bacteria. It's a problem. There's soluble purge paper for piping. There's special purge tapes for purging the inside of pipe. There's even special fittings and purge dams for small bore pipes. If you use stainless steel, you need the corrosion properties of stainless steel. Otherwise, you wouldn't have spent the money for the stainless steel. So you need to maintain the corrosion properties. So you don't want to get it too hot for too long. You don't want to uh, oxidize it on the front side or the back side. You want to use a big enough cup, and you want to use chill blocks whenever possible. Or welding techniques that minimize heat input. You want to get in, you want to get out. You want to start, you don't, you, you know, actually sometimes welding too cold can actually overheat it because you have to go so slow, but you can also weld too hot and overheat it. So that's why, that's why the old timers and anybody you talk to that welds a lot of stainless steel, they talk about color. You want to have that stainless steel, you want to have some color in the weld. You know, almost, you can almost say that if you have some color, you're okay. It doesn't good straw colored weld is really good a little blue and purple no problem either you're in good shape here it doesn't have to be perfectly straw with barely a little bit of blue or purple but it's good if it does it, it doesn't have to be that good but it, if it's black and gray you pretty much cooked it you pretty much oxidize the surface you might have depleted some of the chromium chromium is the main thing that provides the corrosion resistance if you get rid of the chromium you don't have the corrosion resistance. And keeping it too hot for too long lets the chromium and carbon kind of marry together and tie up and, and, and form chromium carbides and then you deplete certain areas of chromium because the chromium is now turned into carbides and those grain boundaries will set up corrosion because they're chromium depleted. That's known as carbide precipitation. Um, it's also known as sensitizing the metal to corrosion because you have sensitized it by depleting certain areas of, of chromium. Matthias from Sweden sent me these pictures of these marine tanks off of boats that have been in service for years and, and the weld areas uh, have finally pitted and rusted. Now these probably served their purpose for years and years, but it, it serves well to, to look at it and just see that stainless steel can rust and corrode. Things you can do pretty much across the board to make all stainless steel welding go well. Plenty of argon. It loves argon. Plenty of argon gas. The next, the next best thing to argon is a, is a good chill on the back side, either copper or aluminum or stainless steel, but not carbon. You don't want to use carbon steel for the chill blocks. Again. This is a perfect world scenario here. This is a, a lot of copper in a chill fixture. It's a test fixture for aircraft test welds. A piece of stainless steel chucked up in there. All that copper will draw the heat out, and it's got an argon port on the back side to shield the back side. I'll show you in a minute how well it works. Keep carbon steel, keep the tools, the carbide burrs, the files, the brushes, the grinding wheels, everything that you've used on carbon. Keep it separate. Separate the stainless steel. Keep it segregated. Put it in baggies, whatever you got to do. Use only, only stainless steel brushes. Use only 
grinding wheels that have only been used on stainless steel. Uh, don't keep the metal too hot for too long. If you're welding multi-pass welds, let them cool plenty in between. Don't get in a hurry and weld back to back to back and get that stuff hot. When it starts turning black and gray, you're going to have a hard time with subsequent passes. They're not going to flow as well. It takes all the fun out of it and it harms the corrosion resistance. So that's my spiel on stainless steel. I'll sprinkle a few uh, pictures here of applications of stainless and, and some arc shots and uh, of some, some things that we can do on stainless steel and also an application for a big cup that I want to talk about. All right. All right. I got to talk fast because I've been bumping my gums for a long time. That fixture, see, look at how quickly it pulls the heat out of that, out of that stainless steel. Along with the big cup with plenty of argon and plenty of chill and argon on the back side, that's a perfect scenario. I'm going to use a technique called backstepping here. On stainless steel, this comes in handy, on stainless steel sheet metal especially, because it warps a lot. It's got a little gap in it. Sometimes that actually helps for distortion because it, it, lets, uh, it lets it shrink a little bit without puckering. But backstepping it kind of keeps it from getting out of hand on distortion. So just welding, instead of welding this whole five or six inch length, I'm, I'm splitting it up into three different uh, segments and backstepping. Now you, want to, you definitely want to get in and you want to get out. This is not welding extremely fast, but what you want to do is you want to get in, get your puddle started, get your rhythm started, and just stay ahead of the heat. Now watch this. This fixture pulls the heat out so quickly, that in conjunction with the large cup. And I'm just showing you this, but just it's, it's an extreme situation. It's the perfect situation. You, you're never going to hardly ever have a fixture like this with this much chill factor. And... Um, but it just pulls the heat out so quickly that the weld bead hardly discolors at all. It winds up being pretty much silver, not even straw colored. And you don't even have to hold the uh, argon shielding on it all that long because the copper pulls the heat out so quickly. So, all right, very quickly, review. Types of stainless steels, austenitic, ferritic, martensitic, precipitation hardenable, and duplex stainless steels. Those are basically the, the categories, all right? Austenitic is... Uh, Generally, that's where all the 300 series, uh, what category all the 300 series are in, commonly used in kitchen and food service equipment. Uh, here's some stuff that's used for marine equipment, boat propellers, silverware, uh, or tableware, that is. Uh, and if you, learn, if you went to welding school, you definitely learned how to weld on 300 series stainless steel because it's the bread and butter. It's the cheapest. Process piping systems, like this socket weld, largely 300 series stainless. Body jewelry for piercing made out of 316 typically because it is more corrosion resistant and it needs to be because some people get a little carried away. That's all I'm saying. I mean, I'm, I'm, yeah, we're good. All right, Martin Siddick stainless steels. 410 stainless along with some funky things like Greek gask alloy and jet heat commonly used on aircraft. Ferritic, you see those in exhaust systems like 409 uh, 409 stainless steel. It's almost a straight chromium with a with a low carbon content. It's it's, it's uh it resists heat and, and scaling. Your precipitation hardening are found on aircraft stainless uh, aircraft parts like this exhaust sleeve. And that's about it for today. I'm sorry it was so long. Thanks for watching. Weldingtipsandtricks.com.